Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our latest CIM Practical Insights webinar, How to Build Social Media into Your Content Marketing Plan. Today, we're joined by Nick Baggett. Nick is one of our expert course directors, specializing in digital marketing, social media, content marketing, CRM, and multi-channel marketing. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few points so you know how to participate in today's event. Firstly, the webinar will last for approximately one hour. Uh, please remember that all attendees are muted, so the only voices you'll hear will be mine and Nick's. You can, however, ask questions, and you can do that throughout the webinar by typing into the questions pane on your attendee control panel. At the end, we'll then try and address as many of those as we can during the Q&A session. Anyway, I don't want to take any more of your time up with admin details, so pass straight over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Nick Baggett and let's say CIM course director, um, and uh, I'm going to talk you through today how you can build social media into your content marketing plan. Um, so our agenda really for the day, um, first of all I'm going to just talk about some key content marketing trends, uh, why content marketing is so important, um, and then talk a little bit about how business buying decisions are made, so the role that content marketing, social media plays, particularly in a B2B space, but also in a consumer space as well and how you get the balance right between owned, earned, and paid media and selecting the appropriate media um, and balance between those. We'll then go on to talk a little bit about uh, customer engagement. Um, I'll introduce you to a simple model of four stages of customer engagement and how you can use that model to help you select which media channel to use when, how to measure customer engagement, and of course ultimately get people to become advocates of your brand, sharing your content with other people. Um, at the end, we'll go into some more practical tips on using specific channels. Um, hopefully, we'll have time for all of them today. We'll start off with the kind of content publishing channels like blogging and video, YouTube, etc. Um, and then I'll go on to just a couple of social media channels, Twitter and, uh, and Facebook. Obviously, I'm conscious there's a, a huge range of social channels we could do, but we only have um, an hour today. I like to start every single session pretty much I run with the same quote. A few years ago, I used to work on a, a project for Microsoft called Digital Ignition, um, and uh, the key consultant who was working on the project was a guy called Mohan Sani from Kellogg's in the US. And, uh, Mel and uh, Mohan um, had a lovely quote, which I've, I've quoted a lot since. Same rules still apply, we're just working on a broader canvas with a richer set of colors. What effectively he's saying here is that today we're going to talk about a, a lot of uh, content marketing, social media, digital marketing opportunities, um, the basic fundamental skills that will make your programs work are exactly the same as if they're offline. So things like having clear objectives, having measurement, testing and learning, segmentation, understanding your audience, customer insights, all those things are still absolutely fundamentally true. Now, we don't have time today to go through all of those step by step, but it's just hopefully a reassuring point that before you even think about your content marketing or social media plan, those fundamentals need to be in place um, first of all. Um, so I like to use the, uh, the less articulate but slightly more memorable phrase of old rules with new tools. So I thought I'd start off by just talking about some of the key trends that I've picked up from talking to, to marketers through my role um, as a course director for CIM. Obviously, I typically meet uh, 20, 30, 40 new marketers every single week. Um, so I hear lots of different organizations and companies and the challenges that they're facing. Um, and so these are some of the, the kind of key themes really that I'm picking up. Now, after I've shown you this slide, I'm going to put a, a quick poll in. Um, I'm going to ask you which of these five you think are affecting your business the most. So you can have a think about that as, uh, as I talk through. So the first thing is around uh, thought leadership, I guess. So um, one of the key things about content marketing is it's very much a consumer pull rather than brand push um, channel. Um, and uh, thought leadership is crucial in terms of getting people to come to your content rather than somebody else's. So um, what I'm seeing is particularly in the B2B space or a more considered um, longer term purchase where consumers are doing their research and testing and checking things before they buy, um, then um, it's really important that you've got that content. So when, for example, a business is considering changing its uh, IT infrastructure, for example, and they start hunting for content, it's your content that comes up. And I think the reason why it's so important in B2B is that businesses tend to compete on the basis of I'm smarter than you are, I'm cleverer than you are, my technology is, is better than yours, rather than, whereas in B2C it's often more brand, customer experience oriented. So um, thought leadership is absolutely crucial. A lot of the things we'll be sharing today in terms of content marketing um, is kind of show, is thinking about showing your expertise um, with your potential customers. And sometimes that expertise comes from within your organization, subject matter experts in your business, Sometimes it comes from your customers as well, and I'll show you, share with you a couple of examples of that as well today. 
Second big trend is about personalization, the integration of digital marketing with CRM. How do we not just use social media as a communications channel, but also use it as a customer learning channel? How can we uh, capture all of the interactions of our customers, understand what their needs are, what their behaviors are, and personalized experience back? And certainly channels like Facebook and Twitter, uh, Google, um, are all becoming much more personalized to the user. So we're all seeing very uh, unique experiences. The third big area is mobile. Um, half of Google searches these days are on, are on mobile. Um, Solo Mo is social local mobile, so that's social media integrated with mobile marketing on a kind of very much on a local level when we use apps, etc. So mobile is a kind of key trend that we need to always consider and think about. Google um, now has changed its algorithm for search um, so that if your site isn't uh, mobile responsive, then you're going to suffer in search engine optimization as well. So mobile is really important. Uh, then we have the change, really, in emphasis of the types of communication that brands are doing. Previously, there was lots of outbound push marketing, spamming people with outbound emails or advertising, etc. Well, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is inbound marketing. It's about creating content that when people are hunting for a solution, they're going to go and find, they're going to search for it in Google or in their social media channels. It's going to be recommended to them, and they're going to find it when they're ready to buy. So a real shift in emphasis in terms of the role of marketing being about creating that content that people will find rather than pushing content out to people in the hope that you find someone who will respond to you. And of course, finally, there's the huge range of communication channels that are constantly out there. So we'll talk today about blogging and Twitter um, and Facebook. We'll also talk about Periscope as well. But that's just scratching the surface of some of the channels that we could potentially um, talk about. And there's always something new. Periscope, I think, is very exciting from Twitter. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on today. So the first poll of the day, um, I'll just bring it up for you. Um, is get the right one. Um, it's just to ask you um, which of those five channels um, do you think is um, the one which is kind of most um, affecting you at the moment? Okay. So uh, what we uh, what we see is actually that uh, that thought leadership one being uh, in the, the top score, as it were, in terms of what you're doing at the moment. Perhaps a, a little bit less emphasis um, on some of the uh, the data and mobile things as well. But uh, thought leadership um, really crucial. So I'll just quickly. Uh, send that result to you. Thank you very much for that poll. Um, next thing I just wanted to talk about, I guess it's another, another big trend, is the way that we're buying media. So as brands, as I said, we're focusing much more on inbound content marketing rather than that push advertising outbound marketing. And we see that reflected in the way that people are buying media. We've always defined media in terms of paid, owned, and earned. So the paid media, the advertising you're paying for, owned media where you're publishing, earned media is a, traditionally PR coverage, but now it might very easily be users sharing your content with other users. And one of my key messages today, I think, is when you're using social media, it's not just about you publishing content and your people following you and receiving it in, in their, for example, in their Facebook newsfeed or their Twitter newsfeed. It's about your users seeing your content, thinking, I want to share this in, in, with my audience, and then hitting the retweet button or the share button on, um, on your blog, for example, and sharing it with their audience. And, that influencing the influencer is probably the most important thing. A lot of brands always talk to me about, why do I need to get thousands of followers on social media? That's not what, what you're interested in. What you're interested in is how many people see the content I'm creating. Um, a great example of a business moving from paid um, to earned media is Coca-Cola, a uh, huge big consumer brand, was one of the biggest spenders on advertising historically, um, now less so because they're focusing so much more on this content that people will share. Um, have a look at some of their YouTube videos online. There's some wonderful, look up the, uh, the James Bond um, launch YouTube video that they did, um, which you might have seen, or there's a lovely one they did in a student's union, um, a student's union bar with a, with a, called uh, Sharing the Happiness with a kind of false Coca-Cola vending machine, which is all about producing kind of witty, interesting videos that people will share with their, with their audience. But across the board, all of their marketing is very focused on how can I create things that other people want to share? Why do they put names on Coke bottles? Not so I go and buy one with Nick on it, but so I buy one with Nick on it, photograph it, and post it onto my Facebook page and share it and endorse that brand to other people. Uh, this is a slightly old picture of me on the right-hand side here at the uh, London 2012 Olympics. Um, if anyone went onto the Coca-Cola beatbox on there uh, in the Olympic Stadium, um, at the end of it, they handed you an Olympic torch. You could have your photograph taken, um, which I did. And as you walk out, I thought, oh, they're going to charge me £10 or something now to have a printout like they do at Disney World of this photograph. But they didn't do that. When I found my picture on the screen, it said, how do you want to share this image, Facebook or Twitter? Immediately posted it to our Facebook page, sharing that image with lots of people. And up until quite recently, that was still my profile picture on Facebook. So you know, they're always thinking, how can I create bits of content that users will take, enjoy, but then share it with their audiences as well? 
Another great example of that is uh, some work from HSBC. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was one of the judges on the CIM um, awards program, and I had the financial services category, and the winner of our category was a, a piece of marketing from HSB targeting um, expat community. What they thought is, the problem is at the moment is that when people are thinking of a bank, and they say, for example, I'm moving from the UK and I've got a new job in America or China, um, I'll only think of changing my bank account right at the last minute, and they wanted to be at the forefront of your thoughts before people had even travelled, before they'd even thought of going overseas or when they're in the consideration phase, effectively. Um, so their expat site um, is full of content, which is that expats might search for in Google um, before they consider moving. Um, and all of that content is user-generated. So you'll notice on the, the top bits of content on here, things like how do I learn a foreign language? How do I select a school for my children? Um, how do I uh, understand the, the cultures of business in Japan, for example? But all of that content has been uh, submitted by users, uh, which actually gets them around some of the financial services and social media compliance issues as well. Um, but it basically means that when I'm looking for that sort of content, HSBC site comes up, brings people to the site, they start reading this content, getting value from it, and then hopefully um, ultimately opening an account with HSBC as they travel. Um, so that, that content might come from the consumers. More often it comes um, from, from the brand itself. And the crucial thing is just making it super easy for consumers to, to take and share that content. So um, I do quite a lot of work with the Meningitis Research Foundation. My son had it when he was a small child, and ever since then I've, uh, I've supported them by giving them some free consultancy every year. And um, well, one of the things that we've, we've come across is that the big challenge for them is how do consumers know what the, what the consequences of meningitis are, how do they know what the symptoms are. That's the sort of thing that people are searching for in Google. So they've created a bit of, bit of content which is called a book of experience. The book of experience is just a whole series of stories from people who've had meningitis. Some are happy stories, some are very sad stories. And every time somebody comes into contact with a charity, um, they ask them to complete a little mini case study within this book of experience. Some are video-based, some are text-based. Every single time a new one gets created, that content is shared via their social media channels, but it's also they're encouraging the audience um, to share that story with their followers as well. And, and the great thing about charities, it's actually very straightforward, very simple to get charities, uh, to get consumers to share charitable content because it makes the, the charity look good as well. So I think their task is, is somehow slightly easier. So that's what I mean about getting sometimes get, getting the content from consumers and, and from the brand, but also then getting your audience to share that with as many people as possible. I'm going to put up another poll now just to get an idea of which um, social media channels um, you're using um, at the moment. So uh, this, uh, this next question is just from, your, from a Marcom's point of view, from your marketing communication, which of these channels are kind of integral to your existing activity? Okay, so I'll, uh, I think I've given you a chance to have a vote now. So, uh, so what do we say? So LinkedIn, absolutely a huge percentage of you. Um, the big, biggest uh, score by far for, for LinkedIn obviously reflects the fact that this is many of you probably in, in the B2B space um, as well, but obviously Twitter and Facebook as well. Less of you using uh, Instagram. Oh, we've got a few more votes uh, coming in now, some more up-to-date figures. And uh, actually uh, Twitter's overtaken LinkedIn as, uh, as the second wave of voters have, uh, have come in and actually a, a bigger range now as well with uh, with blogging and Google Plus being uh, being used to a limited extent as well. Um, fantastic, thank you. Um, so uh, let's just go back to the slides. Um, and that's something we see quite a, quite a lot. Again, as I, as I travel around delivering social media training, one thing I notice um, is that uh, historically, and maybe two or three years ago, as I walked around company to company, I'd say, what channels are you using? And they would normally be giving me a huge list of 10 or 15 channels that they were using on social media, principally because they weren't quite sure which ones were going to be the, the ones that would work best for them. What I see now as I go around, and this is reflected in this piece of data, which is um, a global survey that was done back in the uh, back end of 2014, asking brands around the world, actually in 82 countries, which social media channels they use for business. Excuse me. What, uh, what we see is actually brands using fewer and fewer as they start to think, actually, I realize the amount of time and effort it takes to, to manage each of these accounts. Let's do a great job at managing, let's say, if I'm consumer business, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. If I'm B2B, maybe include LinkedIn and maybe not Facebook, for example. Um, but which of those channels are going to have the biggest impact and actually do three or four very well rather than do 12 not so well? And one of the things I often talk to, uh, to clients about 
is it doesn't mean to say you can't have an influence over something like Instagram or Pinterest just because you're not publishing content in that channel all the time. One of the things I do with my blog, for example, is at the end of every single blog post, there's a little uh, line of icons which allows my readers to, to take that blog post and post a link to it in any channel of their choice. And not only does it have all of the channels that you see on, um, on that chart there as well, but it also has things like Baidu for China and uh, Be Contacted for Russia because my audience is quite global. Um, so people can choose where they share the content. So I'm creating it, they're sharing it in their channel of choice. But in terms of the, the, the channels you are actually out pushing content into, then I'm seeing clients using fewer and fewer channels and trying to really focus on doing them well and having a really good interactive experience with their audience. Um, kind of last chart of, uh, of stats really is, uh, is this is a kind of snapshot of the UK um, social media profile. And I guess one of the key things from, uh, from the UK point of view, this is obviously consumers rather than businesses now, um, is how most of the channels are just reaching closer to saturation and getting older. So things like Facebook, for example, uh, in this particular piece of research, um, it shows that 55% of the 65 and overs in the UK um, have a Facebook profile. That doesn't mean to say they're necessarily actively posting every single day on Facebook. They might be just following their grandchildren and nieces and nephews and looking at content. Um, but we're, we're seeing for the core channels, the, the Facebooks and the Twitters, etc., gradually in the UK the profile gets older as it gets closer to saturation. We're also seeing an interesting trend where the very young audiences, the kind of 16 to 20 year olds, um, still on Facebook, perhaps using it less often than they were um, before as they start moving towards Snapchat and Instagram and other, other channels, partly because um, they're the new things and the nature of being an early adopter is you want, always want to try new things. Um, but also partly because um, their parents are using Facebook, so why would they want to uh, uh, use the same channels that their parents are using? Um, so, um, talking specifically about B2B, I was talking earlier on about the, the role that content marketing plays in a kind of pull rather than push type environment. Um, this is a piece of research that was done by, uh, by Google a couple of years ago, looking at how, I, how businesses buy big IT type projects. And one thing they found is that the typical business might be 57% of the way through their buying cycle before they have any serious engagement with their sales team at all. So the old model would be that marketing generate leads, people respond, they pass them on to sales, sales follow them up. That's kind of how we always used to work. So marketing doing their advertising, their lead generation, etc., and then passes it on to sales. But I think it's interesting now that actually marketing is still creating all of that awareness and interest and desire and consideration amongst, amongst the target audience. Um, but the customer won't necessarily respond straight away. They might think, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, that's, you know, that's something that I want to consider. But rather than picking up the phone and saying, sales guy, come in and pitch to me, they're doing their own research. They're going into LinkedIn groups and asking questions, or they're, um, they're searching in Google, or they're hunting for blog content, et cetera, or they're asking colleagues. Um, so the, the customer is so much more informed than they were in the past. Um, so it's really important that if someone's, say, for example, thinking, you know, I'd really love to tour South America on vacation this year, um, that if you're, a, you know, if you're the Peru tourist board, as it were, you want to make sure that when people are hunting for cool places to go in South, Af South America, that Peru uh, comes up on the list. And that's about creating content that people you know, are finding valuable, that is so social media friendly, that is also uh, search friendly as well. Um, and part of that is about getting customer engagement, of course. And there are different stages of engagement. And in a moment, I will introduce you to these kind of four stages of customer engagement and will help you with your media planning for your social media activity and putting put together a whole strategy. And engagement is, is so key. This is a piece of research uh, published by Simply Measured very recently in June um, of this year, asking marketeers when they're doing social media marketing, kind of, you know, what are the most important metrics? And absolutely the most important metric in this case is engagement. Um, others are, is it the right target audience? Am I generating leads as well? Um, so we tend to, I tend to say that clients should be measuring two things with their program. One is, are people engaging with the content and sharing it with other people? And then almost like as a separate axis, is it generating revenue, leads, opportunities, sales off the back of it as well? And those two things are quite different. You can have people who are highly engaged but not buying, and it's worth knowing and tracking and measuring those people. And there are also people who might be buying from you habitually but actually not engaging with any of your, uh, your content as well. Um, so it's important you look at both tracking where people are in the sales funnel, which most businesses are generally pretty good at, particularly in B2B space, um, but also how do I track people in terms of that engagement funnel as well and knowing what stages of the engagement process they're at. So in order to be able to measure it, you need some sort of model. Um, so the model that, that I use, that I've created over the years, is a very simple four-stage uh, model of customer engagement. Now, 
There are lots of other engagement models out there. This isn't sort of completely unique thinking. Most media agencies, uh, management consultancies, for example, have similar models with similar stages. Um, but uh, just to kind of talk you through, it doesn't matter if you use this model or a different one, but the point is you need to have some sort of model in order to be able to track and measure engagement and therefore um, plan your campaign accordingly. So the four stages I use are acquire their attention, participate, i.e. get them to do something as a result, then, then build continual ongoing engagement, and then finally get them to become share, sharing advocates with other people. If you do it well, that sharing becomes your new acquisition strategy because they start recommending it to friends and retweeting it, retweeting it and sharing it in forums and, and those sorts of things. Um, so the crucial thing, this diagram, just to simplify it down, shows it as a nice linear way from acquire to participate to engage share. Well, we don't necessarily buy that way. You know, it may well be that uh, you go from acquire to participate to share. You might miss out one stage very easily. You might go backwards and forwards. So think of it more as kind of four levels to reach. Have I reached the first level? Have I, got their have I acquired their attention? Have I reached the second level? Have I not just got their attention, but I've also got them to do something? Go through to my website, watch the content, watch the video, read the blog, uh, follow me on Twitter, whatever it may well be. The third level, which is what social media is really good at, isn't they just come once to my website and participated, but you're continuing to, continuing to do so. There's an ongoing dialogue. You're attending all of my webinars, or you're asking to see me face to face, um, or you're following me on social media and you're reading all of my posts over time. So the only real difference between participate and engage is just participate is the first time you do something. Engage is that you're doing it on an ongoing base, basis. There's more of a relationship going on there, a dialogue, as it were. And then finally, the, the fourth level, the, the top level you want to reach, is the advocacy piece, where people not only are engaging with your content, sharing it with other people and advocating it. And that's really the, the key trick for, um, for brands that are successful in this space, is how do I get people to share it? And once you think about those four stages, it also allows you to make your choices of media very straightforward. Each of those four stages naturally uh, suits certain digital media channels. This just shows some of the, the digital channels you might, uh, you might potentially use. So for acquiring your attention, I've got to put my message into the media that you're consuming. So I have to use whether it's Google search, paid or, or optimization, whether it's thought leadership content, whether it's PR, whether it's online advertising. Somehow I've got to put my message into the media you're consuming. So maybe there's a bit of paid media um, in there as well as some, uh, some shared media as well. The participate is normally where the earned media, sorry, where the owned media comes, which is using that acquire interest you've generated to get it to go to the media that you've created for yourself, your blog, your website, your YouTube channel, your webinars, whatever it may well be. Um, engage typically is then um, the, the social media channels often. Um, could also be email marketing in a CRM sense. And then share is obviously the earned media where you're taking that content and sharing it, they're sharing it with their, with their audience. I mentioned you could use this model for, for measurement as well. Well, how might you do that? Well, as long as you understand what the four stages are across the top here, you can start to say, well, what behaviors can I track that will tell me where the customer is on the buying process? So um, this is a, a sort of stylized version of something when I used to work on American Idol, the, the TV series that we put together for them a few years ago. Um, but effectively, every interaction with a customer that we could track, we could say, at what stage of that relationship do we think they would be in? And in this case, the model scored 1 to 10, but it could be 1 to 40 or 14 or 3 or 6. Well, not 3 because there are four stages. But uh, you know, we have to kind of think about what different behaviors are there that would tell me at what stage they're in and how can I track that. And as soon as you can track it, I can start to score it and see which campaigns are working um, or not on that basis. So if that's kind of using engagement to score, the next question is, well, can I actually use it to plan the whole campaign? I've looked at media planning. Uh, we've, looked at score, we've looked at scoring and measuring them. Um, so how can we actually use that um, to actually build a program? So I thought I'd uh, tell you a little story about uh, a client I worked with uh, a year or so ago. Um, EY was um, Ernst & Young uh, originally. They've had a program called Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, it's been around now for a number of years. Um, historically, it was a... Um, awards program, a quite expensive customer hospitality program really where um, every year, this is a global program, um, in each country EY would um, crown UK Entrepreneur of the Year or France Entrepreneur of the Year through a various, a typical um, awards process with the different rounds and judges ex as you expect from any kind of business awards program. And they would have their dinner, they'd crown a winner and then all of the uh, national winners 
would uh, would go around and uh, go to uh, Monte Carlo. There'd be a global awards dinner, and they would all get crowned as well. And they would generate a bit of PR from it, some good customer hospitality. But what it wasn't doing was really driving kind of engagement with a wider audience, other than just a few people who would enter it. Now. In order to become UK Entrepreneur of the Year, you have to have a huge turnover, you have to have huge growth, you have to be you know, a famous person in the media. Most people will never have a chance to win. So they were finding a lot of people thought, oh, Entrepreneur of the Year, that looks interesting, going to the website, seeing what the entry criteria was, and then just walking away and thinking, this isn't for me. Um, EY realized that the role of this wasn't really about an awards program, which is a kind of expensive piece of hospitality. It was about creating content and thought leadership act, um, content, which would make them synonymous with entrepreneurship. So even whether you were going to win the award, whether you were just a small business of 10 people in, um, you know, who was never going to win the award, but who was actually see themselves as an entrepreneur, would still follow the content and start to engage with um, EY so that EY could uh, interact with them and ultimately sell them some of their services. It might just be their accounting services that they sold as a result. Um, so it's all about becoming synonymous with being being entrepreneur and being seen as the experts in entrepreneurship, as it were. And it's an area they think they have a, a kind of competitive advantage against some of their competitors. So when they were planning the program uh, for the last year, um, what we said was, well, let's think about the four stages. First of all, how do we acquire people's attention? Well, again, we need to put our message for this entrepreneurship into the consumer they're reading. So that needs to be a mixture of PR, search engine optimization with Google, and some display advertising, and obviously emailing existing contacts that they have as well and to let people know that this year's program is available. Then uh, people come to the website, and in the past, if they couldn't enter, they went away again. Now there's effectively two buttons on the website which says, I want to enter, or I just want to know more about being a good entrepreneur. And 95% of the people click on the, I just want to be a good entrepreneur. I want to follow the content of this activity so I can, I can learn and be educated by it. So effectively then splits into people going through the entry process and trying to win the competition, and people going through the follow process where they're just trying to get uh, information, thought leadership around being a good entrepreneur. Um, the people obviously then go through the entry process, go through, and there's a winner as, as there would normally be. But the content that gets created through that whole entry process is brilliant for sharing. So they'll share winners' stories, um, surveys, results, things like, you know, what are the big themes of the year? So, for example, last year there were more women entrepreneurs in the finalists than there ever had been before. So they produce a white paper on what makes a successful female entrepreneur. They then also create a, a training program which they can sell to their customers for women leaders about uh, what the difference is for female entrepreneurs to male entrepreneurs, which becomes a product which they can, they can sell. So they're taking all of the content of this program about the greatest skills of entrepreneurship and sharing it with as many people as possible. What makes it great, though, of course, is that the winners are normally highly influential people. In order to win the program, you've got to be successful, you've got to be a big media star, as it were. Um, so the winner in India last year um, it was uh, this guy here, Uday um, Kotak. He won the Indian prize. As soon as he wins, what's the first thing he's going to do? He wants to tell everybody that he's the greatest entrepreneur in India. You wouldn't enter this competition if you weren't slightly egotistical and your brand didn't want you to become a, a kind of famous media personality. So he immediately shares the, the, uh, the content with his audience, and he's got 41,500 followers. So uh, you know, immediate, imagine you've got 130 countries winning. Each one's got a, um, a winner. Each one's got tens of thousands of followers. As soon as they get crowned, getting those people to share the content is going to have much more influence than just you tweeting out to, uh, to your own customer audience. So that's what we mean by the kind of power of share and, and how the things, uh, things fit together. So hopefully that kind of first half of the session um, has given you some good tips and advice on um, kind of develop, developing a plan for, for social media and content marketing effectively. Uh, for the second half of the session, what I plan to do now is to is to walk through um, some of the um, some of the key kind of tips on how to use those core channels uh, more efficiently um, and effectively. And before I do that, I was just going to put up another survey question. So let me just bring up this one, which uh, I'd be interesting to know of the four stages, which of them um, do you think is the one that um, is most likely um, to um, so which is the key focus for, for, your, for your business at the moment? Is it about acquiring the attention of people who don't know you, getting people who do know you to participate, come to your website and start clicking things? Is it about ongoing engagement with those people once they've come once, getting to keep on coming back and building a dialogue? Um, or is it about um, advocacy, um, getting those people to, uh, to share as well? So I've got the, uh, the first few, uh, few votes um, through now, and uh, the kind of initial uh, winner on that is Engage. Um, no huge surprise um, for me. It's actually a bit of a trick question because uh, something I, 
I quite often set people as a task when we come to the training. Obviously, the results are changing as more results are coming in. Um, but uh, in reality, you have to focus on all four. You know, you can't just say, right, this year we're just going to focus on engage and nothing else, because you've got to get them to come to the website in the first place to allow them to engage. So you do need to think about all four stages. It's really about emphasis, um, and often the biggest challenge. You know, if, and it often depends on the market you're in. If you're in a uh, in B2B, it's often more about engagement because people not typically know who you are. It's a smaller pool of potential suppliers and uh, um, and customers. It's quite rare in B2B that your potential customers don't know um, who you are. It's more likely that they're familiar with you, and it's more about kind of creating preference um, over a competitor. Whereas in B2C, um, where there's often much more choice, it's, much, it's often much more about acquiring their attention, as it were. So it, it kind of does differ a little bit from, uh, from sector to sector. But what I would say is, obviously, you need to focus on have a strategy for all four stages and have a media plan for each of the four stages. But each year, your emphasis might change. So a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, I used to work with Diageo on the Baileys um, program. And uh, for Baileys, in the first year, we need to get people into the program. So most of the budget in the first year was spent on acquisition um, channels to get people to go through to the website and click and sign up and to receive more information. But as the as year on year the program improved, what we'd start to do was um, change the emphasis. So we didn't need to spend as much money on acquire. We can spend more money or more effort um, on participate and engage, and ultimately towards share. And the last time I spoke to the brand manager, which was a, a little while back now, she was telling me that actually the acquisition budget now is really tiny because it has a critical mass of people in the program. Um, but also, so many people in the program share that content with others, but actually they don't need to, to acquire new customers because the audience acquires them for them. By creating good quality content, they share it with the next person who shares it with the next person, and the number just organically grows um, each year. So I think the, uh, the final results are in now, and about 40% um, engage is the, is the highest score, acquire second, uh, participate third, and, and share is fourth. Don't underestimate share. It's, not all, it's often the, uh, one, of those one of those things that is underemphasized. It's one of the simplest things to get right, just making it easy for people to take your content um, and sharing it. I use a, a little free application called addofthis.com. So that's addofthis.com, and that allow you to create that little icon to put onto your, onto your content to make it easy for other people to share it. Okay, back to the uh, back to the slides now. So, as I say, for the second half of this uh, of this webinar, I'm going to try and give you some guidance and tips on using some of the those key channels a little bit more um, efficiently um, and effectively, um, as it were. So, um, <clears throat> the first one uh, I'm going to first one I'm going to talk about are, are channels where you might create content and host content. And then we'll talk about the social media channels you might share it with, a, with other people. So uh, blogging and YouTube are, are two pretty key channels um, in terms of hosting content. And certainly one thing that we, we see um, is that uh, there's, a, there's a, again, a, a changing emphasis over time, video becoming so much more important. So I'm going to talk about blogging here in terms of you know, typing a written blog, as it were. But increasingly, blogging um, is becoming the kind of domain of uh, video-based blogs or vloggers um, as well, or YouTubers in, in that way as well. You know, industries like uh, computer gaming and movies and those sorts of things. It's the it's the video bloggers that are that they're often uh, often key. But I'll keep it simple for the for the purposes of the short time we have today, and just talk about blogging in terms of writing a written blog, um, which is obviously very search friendly. And then we'll go on to talk about YouTube as a as a kind of a video channel. Um, certainly for me, um, as somebody who is a kind of CIM course director, the blogging is easily the most important channel for me as a as marketing. I effectively create the content in blog in my blog, um, and then tweet the link to it, and then people follow me on Twitter, find the uh, uh, find the blog, and read it effectively. And blogging is the way I can demonstrate to people that I'm a thought leadership a thought leader. I'm an expert in the um, in the topic, as it were. It's very rare that I get a, a call for some from new business where people haven't actually read my blog um, in advance. They typically use it almost as a uh, as a consideration tool, check me out before they get in contact, as it were. Um, so blogging is key. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you with you a, a client's ex um, uh, case study of a blog, um, and then after that, um, show you some tips on, on how to do it more efficiently. Um, so Trelleberg is one of the biggest engineering businesses in Sweden. I think it's actually about the third or fourth biggest privately owned business um, that's based in Sweden. And they make lots of... Um, industrial things that are rubber and polymers, so things like tires for tractors and things like that. Um, and uh, the business is very acquisitive, so they're always every year buying new businesses um, and growing um, in that way. And a couple of years ago, they bought um, a business 
um, which um, is in the fender business. So if you imagine if, if you've ever been on a boat, whenever you go into a harbour and the, stop the boat smashing against the, uh, the side, the, the walls of the harbour, then you hang fenders over the side like little tyres, effectively. And the business they bought was quite a small business that was really creating fenders for small boats and small craft. Trelleberg's business, though, is about large industrial scale, huge million pound contracts. They're not really interested in small, small pleasure boats and things like that. So they bought the business and said, right, we're going to re-engineer you as a business and turn you into a business that will supply fenders, but for oil rigs and navies and warships and uh, you know, ocean liners and things like that. Now, in that sector, they had no reputation. In fact, they had no product when they first started. Um, but they really didn't have, an, you know, they weren't well known at all in that sector. And that's, but that's where the, the big contracts are to be won. Um, and they had very little budget. This is, you know, this is a smallish engineering business. So um, what they decided to do was uh, to do a survey amongst their customers to create a bit of thought leadership content, probably the oldest PR trick in the book. Um, find 100 customers, ask them a survey, and then publish the results of the survey. <coughs> So they had the plans to do the survey already. In fact, they'd done a survey the previous year. And what they did once they published the survey was turned it into a sort of 16-page booklet and white paper and then published it. What we said to them was, hang on a second, just think a little bit about how this content should best be created, how should it, how should it be stored, and how should it be shared as well. Um, so they did the survey. I think actually in this particular year, um, they sent it out to 250 potential customers around the world. They got something like 140, 150 of them back. And once they got the results back, rather than publishing it as one big article, what we said was let's create a blog um, and set up a Twitter account for it. And what we'll do is we'll release the results of the survey week by week, question by question. So every single week, um, they would publish a blog post and tweet a link to the blog post to say, Question one was, you know, how optimistic are people about the future of our industry? These are their answers. This is our interpretation of those answers. Um, and if you want to download the full survey, this is where you go to find it out. And they were just build, gradually building it up, so, the, so it was spreading that content over a long period of time. So it probably took them 10 or 12 weeks to actually share all of the content that they would have shared in one go um, originally. Um, I say before the blog, they were completely unknown by their audience. About four weeks into... Um, the publishing cycle, they had a phone call out of the blue from somebody at the Hong Kong um, Harbour Master saying to them, um, been reading your blog, searching in Google for information about it. Your blog came up. Um, I've read it. Um, you guys obviously know a lot about this industry. Would you like to tender for a contract? And they won a huge million-dollar contract with the Hong Kong Harbour as a result of, uh, um, of running the blog. And that, the cost of it was almost nothing. You know, a blog, tweets, survey, very, very low-cost activity. So you know, the, the crucial thing here is just making things into small bite-sized chunks. So some, some blogging success tips. Um, this is taken from a book called, um, by uh, Scoble and Israel um, called Naked Conversations. Um, there's kind of lots of tips on here, most of them fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. The key ones I'm going to talk about really here are talk, don't sell, um, and post often and be interesting. So talk, don't sell is about the difference between your website and your blog. Your website is about the products you have, you know, off, you know, much more kind of commercially focused. Your blog is about what you think. So think about your website as what you do. Your blog is what you think. You know, this, this is demonstrating our knowledge and expertise effectively. So it has a clear differentiation between what the blog's there to do and what the uh, and, and what the website's there to do. Post often and be interesting is about having an opinion on things. Um, so even if it's only a short link piece where you say, say for example a blog post might be, I went to a conference this week or I'll tell you what, I listened to a webinar today from a guy called Nick Maggot. What I learned in the webinar was X, Y, and Z, um, and if you want to find out more about it, this is where you go to find out more. The interesting thing is I've still added in the middle, what I've learned today was, you're always adding your, your, uh, what you've learned, your, your spin on, on, on that piece. So uh, your blog must always say, here's something I've learned, this is what it means, and therefore this is what you can do differently. So always putting your opinion on things, even if it's just a piece of content that somebody else has created, you're always going to share your thoughts on it, as it were. So it's about having an opinion. If your business is one of those businesses where you're not allowed to have an opinion in public, then blogging is not right for you. Um, sometimes you might think, actually, I'm never going to write a blog myself, but what I will do is I'll find who's influential in my business and influence those people. Um, and a lovely tool, which is free, that I use quite often, this is a kind of simple practical tip, a website called wefollow.com. 
type in the uh, the topic in this case university and it will basically give you a list of the people who are most influential on that topic whether it's through social media like Twitter or uh, or through their blog it's not fail safe but it's free so it's a kind of good place to start to get a initial list of people you might want to consider trying to influence it's often more effective to say rather than me creating my own blog I'll create a piece of content and I'll get an existing blogger who's already trusted by their audience who has a large-scale audience to share it in the way that you would do a, a journalist with PR um, other content channel I want to talk about was video. YouTube is obviously uh, the leader here, but as you'll see from later on, um, Facebook, Twitter, etc., all desperately trying to um, take the lead in uh, um, in video as well. A big battleground going on for video at the moment. Often the most successful videos are the how-to videos. You know, how to learn how to cook a Sunday roast in 10 minutes, or how to uh, lay a hardwood floor, how to choose a university in this particular case. Um, so those how-to videos are great. They, they're very popular on YouTube. They also often reduce the number of calls you get in customer services as well because uh, um, if you can refer people to it. I had a, an issue recently with my son's Xbox, and I phoned up Microsoft and uh, asked some advice, and they said, uh, oh, no problem. This is a technical question. Do you have access to the Internet? Yes. I'll send you an email with a link. I followed the link. It played me a little video showing me how to install this particular bit of software. Within 30 seconds, it was done. Easy for them, easy for me perfect solution to the to the problem as well. Um, so you can create channels on, on YouTube when you have more content. There, there are branded channels um, or a kind of free personal channel. For most brands, a free personal channel is probably uh, adequate for what you might want to do. Um, so that's some of the kind of key content channels. Um, next thing I just wanted to talk about was some, uh, some tips and updates really on um, some of the kind of core uh, social uh, social media channels. So I'm t for, the, for the purpose of today, I'm just going to focus on, uh, on what's going on at Facebook and Twitter just because we only have uh, 18 minutes left and I want to give you some time to answer some questions. I see uh, lots of questions coming in. I know some have been answered as we, uh, as we go through because some of them are technical. Um, some of the best questions um, will be asked of me at the end. So I want to make sure I've given sort of five or ten minutes for that um, at the end. So before we do that, um, I just thought I'd update you on a couple of things really on Facebook and then um, and also on Twitter as well. So key thing for Facebook, I guess, is um, slight, quite controversial at the moment. Um, Facebook is, well, has been now for about a year, um, deciding what content goes into your newsfeed based on your own behavior. Um, so as a result of that, the content you see on your personal newsfeed is not every single update from every single person you follow. Facebook is saying which people are most interesting to you, which types of content you're interested in, um, what, what, which content that might be seen to you has also been seen by other people, have they shared it, etc. And all of that behavioral data is going into an algorithm, which you see on the, uh, on the screen there, which allows them um, to effectively put content into your newsfeed, which in theory should be the most interest to you based on your previous behavior. That's possibly great from a consumer point of view, although a little bit controversial, perhaps not so good from a brand point of view. For years, you might have spent time building up as, long, as big a Facebook following as possible. So you might have 1,000 or 10,000 or even 100,000 followers on Facebook. Under this new algorithm, it doesn't mean, though, that if you've got 100,000 followers, that when you post something, 100,000 people will see it. And I've seen some data recently from, from a couple of my clients where it's been as low as 8% in one case and 12% in another. They've actually been seeing um, your content in, um, on, on Facebook, even if you follow uh, following that brand. Um, so by understanding the algorithm, it helps you um, to get more people seeing it. So for example, one of the things that's important is how interactive your site is because it looks at how interested you are in that, in that consumer, in that post, based on what you've clicked on in the past, as it were. So having lots of open questions. Also including video um, is also crucial um, because Facebook is tr desperately trying to compete with, uh, with YouTube, wants to be seen as the, the key place to host video. And it's not about posting video on YouTube and putting a link in Facebook. They want you to actually post the video onto your Facebook page as well. So by including video, lots of open questions, will at least get a higher interaction rate with more people seeing your content. But the, the key thing from my point of view is think of Facebook not just in terms of, said, you pushing content out to your followers, but making it super easy for people to find the content you've got on your website and hit the share it on Facebook button so they share it with their audience. And that's really what you want to focus on is getting your users to share it on their Facebook pages rather than so much always getting everyone to follow you. Um, so that's a, just a bit of an update on Facebook. A couple of tips as well on, um, on Twitter um, and uh, again an update on, on Twitter as well. Um, there's a really, um, really useful set of cheat sheets on the Marketo 
uh, website. You'll see there's a link on the bottom of the slide there. Uh, Marketo is a marketing automation um, software um, company. So um, if you've gone to the market, Marketo site, it has lots of uh, advice and tips on how to use all of the social media channels. These are just some of them taken from their page on Twitter, but they have one for, for Instagram and all the other different channels as well. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. There are a lot more actually on the on the cheat sheet, but there's a couple of things I thought were worth highlighting, particularly the, the, the top one, the 411 rule, which says, what should I talk about on Twitter? Um, and their advice, which I would agree with, is that for every one self-serving tweet saying how wonderful you are or how great your products are or the, the contract you've just won or the award you've just won, so for every one of those self-serving tweets, you should do one retweet of somebody else's content and four useful shares. A useful share is when you go onto somebody else's website, hit the share button and post it onto Twitter. So if you follow me on, uh, on Twitter, I'm NJ Baggett on Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter, um, you will... Um, you'll notice that actually occasionally I, I tweet things that I'm up to that I've learned or links to my blog, but most of the things that I share on Twitter are things that I've seen um, from uh, other experts, um, clients, um, journalists, that I think my audience would find useful. So a lot of what I'm doing is just sharing useful things about the industry. And obviously what I try and do on Twitter is share tips and advice on social media and content marketing. So um, hopefully you would find that useful and, and interesting. Um, other things on here... Um, uh, that are, are probably uh, worth thinking about as well. Twitter works very well in the instant um, instant marketing, so live tweet chat, Periscope I'll come and talk about later on. So Twitter is cool, great for things that are happening super fast, either updating people on customer services issues, uh, responding to questions on launch day, um, or just having an opportunity for your audience to have a live tweet chat with your chief engineer or your chief executive or, or somebody like that. It works really well in that kind of fast, interactive um, manner. It's very good for doing that. Um, this is actually from a separate piece of research on the right-hand side, these stats about hashtags um, from uh, Media Bistro. Um, and it basically says um, people who use hashtags receive twice as much engagement. But actually, if you ask people to retweet, you get 10 or even 23 times more um, uh, retweet if you ask for retweeting um, in long. So don't be, don't, be just share, don't be scared to put it at the end of it, please RT on the end of your tweet if you want people to share it with other people. Um, another very sneaky tactic on um, on Twitter is what we call newsjacking. Um, often, you know, you might only have a few hundred or a few tens of followers on uh, on Twitter, um, and you want to receive uh, higher influence for your content. Um, so one thing to do is to effectively take over a hashtag. So you notice if you're watching TV, for example, things like "Have I got news for you?" It says on the bottom of the screen hashtag H I G N F Y, um, or you know any any kind of popular topic at the time, there'll be a kind of a hashtag that everyone's using, say World Athletics Championships at the moment, no doubt it has a hashtag where all of the tweets can be, can be found. Um, so by using those tweets, what it, what it does is it allows, uh, allows your content to be seen by uh, a wider audience by using that hashtag. And a great way of doing it is, like, say, a trade show. So, for example, at the CIM conference um, every year, there'll, there'll be a, um, a hashtag you know, hashtag CIM Conf, for example, if you're sitting in the audience, if you use the hashtag, everybody else in that uh, in that room is likely to have an opportunity to see it as well. So it's about you know taking the popular topics and getting your content into into that story. Um, and then finally on Twitter, I just want to talk about Periscope. If you haven't yet downloaded Periscope and tried it, you should do. I think it was the fastest growing social media platform to ever reach a million um, audiences within about four or five weeks of launch. It's now about uh, maybe four or five months old, I would say. Um, and uh, effectively what it allows you to do is live stream um, content um, through to your audience um, via um, Twitter. You need to download the Twitter Periscope app on your um, iPhone or other smartphone, um, and it will allow you effectively to, uh, to shoot a video live and broadcast it out through um, Twitter. It kind of reflects the, the growing need for, for video content, thought leadership content, and also live content all at the same time. Um, and I think it provides a great opportunity for marketeers. You know, that live Twitter Q&A um, is a sort of thing which you know can be done so much better. It's uh, it's something using something like um, Periscope. So next time you're running an event or something like that, you know it's probably worth having a having a play with it and having a having a try to see how you can use it. There's all sorts of clever functionality. You can make them private. You can um, you can choose at the end of the of the Periscope session to either abandon it and delete it or to post it um, elsewhere. Um, but it's a it's a really great channel and I think a a great opportunity really for for brands to um, to use it. And, and maybe sessions like this in future we'd be doing on uh, Periscope rather than um, as a webcast, um, potentially. 
Um, but even as a consumer, um, I'm obviously I'm, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, uh, Ian Poulter, the golfer, um, a couple of weeks ago when it was raining at one of the golf tournaments, spent an hour doing a live periscope where he was just sitting at his desk um, uh, in the hotel, explaining how he prepares for a round of golf for the day, showing how he looks at the, his club selection and how he maps out the course map and looks at the wind and everything else and just talks through things in detail. So there's all sorts of different uses for periscope. If you're not using it yet, I would go and uh, go and have a little play with it and see what. Uh, uh, see what we do and follow a few people and start to integrate that as part of your activity. So I think I've managed pretty much to uh, to finish on time for the questions. A quick plug for the questions. I see lots have come in. I think there's one last survey um, question um, to put in, which is uh, uh, just coming on here, which is a little bit tweak, uh, a little bit cheeky as well. I've said if you if have you ever tweeted and quoted any of those. Uh, uh, these people, and if not, why not do it now? So while you're thinking of your questions, we'd love you. As I said before, if you ask people to retweet, then you get 23 times as many. So uh, um, why not uh, why not tweet your attendance um, today? Share some of the content with your audience, um, and use uh, um, use one of the um, uh, use either at CIM info or uh, at NJ Baggett, which is my uh, one of more. Just use one of the uh, the hashtags for the event: hashtag CIM or hashtag Practical Insights. So uh, Bit of a bit of a cheeky request there, but uh, um, useful to see if people have done it before. And actually, 69% of you have used hashtag CIM before, which is a great example of newsjacking for someone to to uh, to get your content uh, shared in that environment. Fantastic. Okay, um, so um, I think we have eight minutes left by my calculations now. So I'm going to hand back and see if there are any questions you'd like me to answer. Okay, Nick, thanks very much. It's Steve back again. Um, we're now going to go through the questions, as you say. But first, just to remind attendees, you can, you can carry on answering them. And I'll just dive in and, and answer one that's been asked loads of times throughout the session. Yes, you will be able to uh, view the session again and, and hear Nick's uh, presentation. I'll give you a bit on that right at the very end. So if you just hang on to that. But let's get into to the meat of some of the questions. And actually, this is one that came in quite early on, Nick, but uh, it's quite interesting. This is about um, what happens when your content gets spread around, I guess. Somebody asked, if you've uh, issued a press release or perhaps some other form of content, which has then got used on a third-party news website, what's your thought on uh, sharing a link to that on your social media, um, even though you're sending traffic effectively to somebody else's site? Is, is that a good tactic? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say, again, like all things, it comes down to what your objective is in the first place. If your objective is to, uh, you know, is to build awareness, engagement, consideration, then I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good tactic because what it's doing is it's showing, um, it's, you know, it's, take, it's giving, adding value to your audience, um, and it's also um, getting the, getting, providing, of course, the review is positive, um, then uh, what it's doing is giving that kind of third-party recommendation from the media, uh, from, the, from the news website, um, to uh, you know, to you as a brand, as it were. So I would absolutely endorse that as a strategy, unless your objective is all about kind of data capture and, o and owning that customer relationship and tracking it from a CRM point of view. In which case, what you might do is take some of the content from the third-party news website and kind of reproducing it on your blog and driving people to there within, obviously, copyright laws. There's uh, you need to be careful with uh, with doing that. But um, uh, it's funny when we st when we started. Um, with social media and blogging a few years ago, people were very um, worried about you know copyright and uh, um, and reproducing content. Whereas now, of course, you know because we're in a content marketing world, most people would love their content to be shared with with other people. So, but it's worth just checking your copyright issues around that. But broadly, I would absolutely endorse anyone who gives you a positive review, then link to it on your on your Twitter because it's only all it's doing is recommending your brand and endorsing your brand. Great, thanks, Nick. Uh, the, the next one is, is pretty fundamental, actually, um, chicken and egg sort of question. In your view, do you build a social, social media strategy, then consider content, or do you think about a content strategy and then build in social media? Which way around do you go? That's a great question, and um, I say actually everything comes back to customer insights. So if I go back to the, the first slide where I talked about old rules and new tools and the fundamentals are still true, Effectively, you build your social media strategy like you build any other marketing strategy. So you set your objectives, define your target audience, um, then then you need to develop some sort of customer insight. So by the, the way I normally talk about that is what what is the behaviour change you're looking to 
uh, to change um, and what are the barriers that are stopping somebody making that change so if for example I'm getting trying to get someone who's attended a webinar to actually um, arrange for the salesperson to come and see them um, then I'll be saying you know what are the likely barriers that are going to stop them maybe it's awareness maybe it's lack of trust etc so you kind of go through that insight piece and, uh, and off the back of the back off the off the back of your insight piece you develop content strategy effectively develop your content strategy what do I need to say in order to get over that issue so what content do I need to convince that person to to do what I want them to do and once you've got your content strategy you then think about how am I going to share it so there's no point in having a social media channels and platforms with no content so content is king content comes first based on a customer insight and your objectives and then think about where to share it and don't think about where to share it in your own your own channels and your paid for channels think about how will other people share it so how can I make it super easy for people to take that piece of content and share it in their forums with their audiences with their, uh, in their social media channels as well okay and here's a good one to come in while you were talking about that one Nick somebody's asked yeah. about how you, you, you sort of relate that within the organization how will it how, how successful will it be or how important perhaps will it be to build social media into the content marketing plan internally within the organization for employees I guess to get them engaged yeah, as well as looking exactly out. that's a it's a good really good question there are, there are um, you know often and on your own intranets and um, within well, certainly within larger businesses um, within internet you'll have your own platforms where you'll be able to um, either um, share content through an internal um, Yammer type system which is Yammer is like an internal social media network um, or some sort of closed network obviously you need to be slightly careful about if it's an internal com communications piece make sure the platform can only be seen by employees and not something which is publicly um, shareable you could create a LinkedIn group for example which uh, people um, only employees can join for example but then you've got to make sure that when they leave you kick them out of the group so as long as you, you've got to be kind of careful about controlling that but social media is, is very valid in a um, internal comms point of view I can I give you a good example actually um, uh, one of my former clients a guy called Nick Barley used to be marketing director of, uh, of Microsoft in, uh, in the past and uh, Nick moved on to a new job and he was made European sales and marketing director um, and one of these issues was that people didn't really know who he was because he had a big global team um, and he was new and he wanted to kind of build his, get, make, you know, build his own reputation but also you know, share his philosophy with his new team. And he used to do a kind of memo on a Monday morning when he first started, which was, you know, here are three things we should all be doing and thinking about this week, kind of cascading information down. And he realized that no one was really reading memos. So as a result, what he decided to do was every morning, Monday morning, he did his own internal video blog where he basically just turned on his webcam, sit at his desk, and then talk for three or four minutes about those same three things through a, a video story and then posted it on the internet to their own employees and he found that people were so much more engaged and knew he was and it also made it more approachable so people would stop him in the lift while he was <laughs> going up to the fourth floor and say hey Nick I saw that thing this morning do you want to talk about this and just you know just being a little bit creative about the channels that, uh, that you can use but certainly social media and content marketing has a, a key role to play in internal comms as well as external thinking uh, again about blends of different things I mean we're talking here about social media and content and content through social media how about blending that with other things would you advise using email alongside social to, to publicize say your blogs absolutely I mean e email is um, we're kind of very much changing how we use email as marketeers so you know historically it was used as an acquisition channel effectively spamming people on huge volume you know because of the, um, the CRM world we live in now um, and the fact that social, you know, we're, we're capturing so much more behavioral data, the email increasingly is being used to kind of engage with people either as they go through the buying process or even once they've purchased from a kind of retention and CRM point of view. Um, so you know, I would have a completely integrated program and I wouldn't just be thinking about integrating social media with your email marketing activity. You know, if you've got an existing email marketing database of customers, then to get your social media content shared early, to share it via email is a very valid um, a channel to uh, to do that in the same way that you know last week I was with a telecoms company in uh, um, in Qatar and they were using SMS because SMS is the easiest channel for them so you know whether it's mobile whether it's email but also whether it's offline channels as well don't you know don't don't forget the um, the traditional media channels as well in terms of integration okay probably just time for a last 30 second answer on this one Nick I think yeah user-generated content we've talked a bit about that encouraging people to interact I mean that's great but what can you do to make sure that it's it's a relevant uh, and the sort of thing you want and be not offensive 
Absolutely. I think the, the, the best examples of user generated I've shared with you today, things like the meningitis program, the HSBC, they ask for users to submit content. They effectively edit it and publish the things that I think are worthy of um, publishing. Um, so from a, if you're in a, a sector like financial services, that's crucial. For most brands, it's not such an issue. Um, and um, you know, I, I'm, very, I'm a firm advocate, for example, on blogging to allow um, people to make a comment, et cetera, and, to, and to, to deal with them. So it really depends on your culture. If you're in a controlling culture, financial services, uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, you might want to ask people to submit content. You choose what you want to share, and then you share it. Um, if you're in a less controlled environment, then allow people to, co to comment. You often find that the community, anyone who writes anything particularly, I think if it's offensive or um, libelous, then obviously you just delete it and block the user. If it's just someone who disagrees with you, you normally find the community will sort of self-police anyway. Okay, thank you, Nick. Well, that's, uh, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. We've got loads of questions. We haven't managed to answer them all, but thank you very much for, for you, Nick, and everyone for attending the webinar. Once you leave the webinar today, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we'd really appreciate it if you could complete that and let us have your feedback. That's very important to us. And you'll also receive a follow-up email within the next couple of days, and that will give you a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So that answers all those questions we've received about where to see the material. You'll get a link emailed to you. Um, so that only leaves me on behalf of CIM and Nick and myself to thank you very much for joining us, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Good afternoon from CIM.